I could start off by asking the question, how did a nice Jewish boy from New York end up in Poland? But I'm not gonna ask that question. I'm gonna ask another question, and that is, why are there any Jews in Poland today? After everything that happened to the Jews in Poland before World War II, during the Shoah, after World War II, why should there be Jews in Poland today? September 1st, 1939, World War II begins. At that point, there are three and a half million Jews in Poland. The heart, the soul, the neshama of the Ashkenazi Jewish world. But five years later, in 1944, 90% no longer alive, having gone on Kiddush Hashem, murdered by Germans and accomplices. That statement is so horrific, most people don't think, well, how many survivors were there? About 10% survived. Still 350,000 Jews in Poland after World War II. Where are they today? The vast majority of the survivors leave Poland in the 25 years after World War II. But not all the Jews leave. Some Jews stay. And the Jews who stay, most of them decide not to be Jewish anymore. Stay Jewish, leave communist Poland. Stay in communist Poland, stop being Jewish. To the extent that often you didn't tell your children or your grandchildren that you were ever Jewish until 1989. 1989 communism falls and at that point for the first time in 50 years survivors who are no longer that young start asking the question is it safe enough today to tell my children my grandchildren that i'm really jewish and so while a couple hundred thousand jews left poland after world war ii some tens of thousands stayed many of them stopping to be jewish not telling their children and grandchildren so the story of Polish Jews today, in my four and a half minute special, is a story of discovery. Michael Kolber, and um, I'd like to start off, not to be repetitive, but uh, I want to say Jinkuya, which is I found a few weeks bef um, before I went to Poland. I, I'm in uh, another class uh, with Ms. Rosenberg in, uh, in IGMT, and we found out about it a few weeks before. And she, we were like the test, like the test group. Um, oh, would it be guys? I think we're planning a trip to Poland. Do you like to go? And we're like, oh, of course we like to go. Like, what kind of? Like, what, of course, like uh, we always like really. That seems like a great idea. Like all different reactions. Then class is over. We start to leave, and Avi turns to me, and goes, "You think we're actually gonna get funding for a trip to Poland?" I'm like, no, no. <laughs> This experience really means a lot more than you know because uh, literally we can stand here and tell you our reflections but in reality this trip affected us more more deeply than words.
The meeting with the righteous Gentile was very interesting. It certainly wasn't anything close to what I expected, that not only did she hide Jews in her home, but she also was involved with the resistance in Warsaw. Warszawskie dla ludzi z pochodzenia żydowskiego przyszły do nas, do mojego, do domu moich rodziców dwie osoby, dwie Żydówki, matka i córka. It was really fascinating to me um, some of the things that I just didn't expect at all. For example, she doesn't have a relationship with them. Um, it didn't appear that she particularly liked them, but she still had it in her to really hide hide them and do what she saw was right and to to do really to stand up for the greater good. Mówię o tym dlatego, że te powiedziałam w 42 roku w końcu 42 roku przyszły do nas dwie osoby, dwie Żydówki i zostały u nas do momentu powstania warszawskiego, wybuchu powstania warszawskiego, czyli w 40 do 44 roku 1 sierpnia i moi rodzice postanowili uciekać z tego z śródmieścia, bo mieszkaliśmy w śródmieściu, uciekać ze śródmieścia, a ja, ponieważ często chodziłam na Powiśle, gdzie wydawało mi się, że jest w ogóle rajskie życie, jeden tylko dzień udało mi się umieścić moich rodziców w takim klasztorze. W tej ucieczce została trafiona granatnikiem, rekoszetem moja siostra, która jest żył po dwóch godzinach zmarła mm -hmm. na moich rękach. Dlatego, że młodzi ludzie nie bardzo sobie zdają sprawę z tego, jak, jak okrutną rzeczą jest wojna. A jak widzą człowieka, który na własne oczy coś takiego widział, to może to po prostu zmieni punkt widzenia wielu młodych ludzi. This is the ghetto. We are in the ghetto. Yeah. The other side was outside. Yeah. And it was built, it was the ghetto wall. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the pieces actually we've got in war, so it's not the only one, but this one is actually quite large. Wow. Umschlagplatz. Umschlagplatz was a square, you saw it in a museum, there is a big picture, well I don't remember how big it is, but you, you could also see a wall probably. That's where people were brought in 1942 mainly, between the end of July and the end of September 1942, and from the so-called Umschlagplatz, over 300,000 people in two months only were deported to Treblinka death camp. We are not able to commemorate them all by writing down their names. So these are just first names.
Before I uh, came on this trip, I was talking to my father. My father's a rabbi, and he's never been to Poland. And he was telling me that, he, he, he said, I hope you have a good time. And then he caught himself and he said, I, I don't hope you have a good time. I hope you have like a, a learning experience that you'll take forever. Okay, so this is synagogue I mentioned you about. about uh, we can see information here that it is commemorative plaque uh, to honor 3,000 um, Polish citizens of Jewish nationality, uh, former inhabitants uh, of Kazimierz Dolny, who were murdered by Nazis during the Second World War. Where is this synagogue from? Uh, synagogue was built in 18th century, but it was devastated by Nazis. So this is new one, although uh, one wall is, uh, is original, mm -hmm. but the building is new. But it was built like the old one. You can go inside it. Uh, you know, it's inside, uh, this is museum. Museum, but also uh, there are small rooms for right. tourists. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it belongs to Warsaw Jewish community. Warsaw Jewish community, no Jews here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before the Second World War, before the Second World War, about 80% of population in Kazimierz Dolny were of Jewish faith. Wow, 80%. Mm, 80%, yes. So, so it, was, it was really, really uh, not shtetl, not shtetl, but just, just, just uh, you know, town. It was not anything I thought it would be, because the first thing you do when you get to the camp is you see it in color. Since I'm in third grade, I feel like I've seen black and white footage of a ghetto of people starving or black and white footage of a liberation of a concentration camp and everyone's skinny and they're walking skeletons and all you see is black and white and there is no color. And then there's the barracks and our tour guide Magda was showing us this is where they start and like here and there and they, then they went to this place and then they went to that place like all through the course of the camp moving forward moving forward moving forward all the way to a crematorium. At the end of the tour through the camp, and there, we got to the end, and there's a mountain of ash in the in this like uh, not building, but a little hut, I guess, big hut. And we were standing there, and there was a bunch of other groups there. There were some Hasidim, and there was this Israeli group and a French group, and we're all standing around, and they're all we're, we were all singing. We were all singing the same songs. We found songs that everybody was everybody knew.
So Jason, Blatt, and I, we decided that we'll take, and we'll take charge of the whole entire singing. So between like, I don't know, there must have been like 200 people like standing around this mound of ash, and we started singing Achenu. Standing in Maidanic, singing with those 200, 300 people, was so far, is, is the highlight of my trip. In, in February 1945, we came back to the Krakow. We, we uh, couldn't get to our flat. Uh, he was taken already by Polish government, but he go we got another place and we began to, to live like everybody in Poland. I went to school and you know what? After two years, I went to the Hebrew school, because in Poland there was a Hebrew school called Tarbut. It wasn't religious, it was Zionistic, and I went to the school only four years, for fifth and sixth grades, and then the school was closed by the government. I also was a member of Shomer Hatzair, a Jewish youth organization, also Zionistic, like kind of socialist Zionist. And after two years, it was all finished. But these two years gave me very much as to build strongly my Jewish identity. I always knew who I am. It is easy in Poland. You could believe me, it is easy in Poland, really, because we have our places. Uh, 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 very often I, I have my um, uh, Magen David on me, and uh, uh, I personally, after the war, never ever can any troubles with it. I am, you see, double identity because I am Jew and I am Paul in the same time. Oh, 
all of us. We are not allowed to forget, but we will lift forward, you know. So, and, and, uh, and believe that it is not the end of the Jewish life in Europe. It isn't. Every nation has to remember what its history was, not only good, but also very bad things. It's not forgiving for the criminals of the war. It's not forgiving for them. But I have nothing against the German, the Ukrainian, Lithuanians, nobody who is living now because they are not guilty. Of course, they all uh, 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 ought to remember that all these crimes was part of J history. Thank you. 
Uh, Rabosa, it's been about a month since we're back. You've had the opportunity to reflect. I know that I myself have thought many, many different times about, uh, you know, about the experience uh, that I had there myself, and I'm sure all of you have done uh, something similar. So we have this get-together this evening. We give all the students an opportunity to say something, to reflect, to share what it was that was so special. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to allow me to be vulnerable. I don't know, right now, my thoughts, my thoughts are just all over the place. Um, I could talk for you know, hours um, about this trip. It was really, really uh, an incredible life-changing experience. Really, it feels the way I remember everything we did, because I don't remember it as a blur. I remember each moment in its own way. When you learn something in school or anywhere, really, no matter how great the teacher is, how great the, pr the material is, there's always something you're lacking. Because not only were, did you give us the opportunity to confront the harsh reality that existed in Poland, but you allowed us to engage the community that exists there, open ourselves up, use this, ki this, this kind of aura of vulnerability amongst us in Poland to be, able to, to be able to affect others and engage the Jewish community. I think that's really what's very unique about the exact trip that we did, was that it was about engagement. You know, I believe strongly in the concept of for every strong reaction, there's a strong counter reaction. And the horrible things that the, like, that the Holocaust was, the counter reaction must be something extremely positive and extremely amazing. And I think on that Poland trip, what we saw, we, we saw that amazing counter reaction to the Holocaust. You felt the life. We learned about the thousand years of Jewish history beforehand. We met with the Lauder, the Lauder Foundation, with the JCC. We saw the life after, after it. And that just unexpected energy, it impacts you in a way that you, you can't get anywhere else. The main image that we had of Poland wasn't black and white. And I know that when I saw the other, the other Jews that we were able to impact dancing with us, singing with us, that was the real bloom that we were able to see with the water, with the Torah, with the spirituality that we were able to bring on this trip. It really put Poland into color for me. I realized I'm, I'm from here. And it was just amazing to think that if not for that short little five, six year period of time that was the Holocaust, I would be living here. I heard it over and over from the boys. We saw, we saw what we lost in Poland. Auschwitz, Majdanek, the gas chambers. But we also saw that there's not just death, there's rebirth and there's revival and there's a new Jewish community. And so out of a trip that should have been just dark, it was coming a trip of hope. You people here are really the next leaders of our generation. You are, as your illustrious Madrich said, the ambassadors. You're the ambassadors of Hashem. You are the ambassadors of Yeshiva University. You are the ambassadors of the Jewish people. We'd like to thank you. You know, you were thanking us, but no, we really need to thank you. Because of this trip, a lot of us have a completely different outlook on life. The Poland trip that we went on in March was not just a trip to see the uh, concentration camps, though that was a huge part of it. It was also to see the Polish Jewish community in its present and its future. I was very touched. I thought it was a great way to you know, build on the relationship we had. You know, it just started and a great way to, you know, get involved in the rev revitalization of the Jewish community here in Poland. We were now given this opportunity that we can actually participate in the revival of, of, of Polish Jewry. At first it was a little difficult because there is a little bit of a language barrier. 
Yemet Jason. Jestem. Nagle sit no, down there. Jason. Yemet jestem. Jason. Jestem. Yes, stem, Jason. Oh, wait, no. We still have seven days left. And for plenty of time. Yes, stem, yes, son. Yes, stem. You remember, like, yes? Yes. Yes. Right? And tem. Tem. Tem, right? Yes, stem, yes, son. Okay. I, you know, I, I along with, um, you know, Jason, Shimmy, and Ellie, uh, we lead a, a class on how to read the sitter. Um, and I also teach um, a woman, uh, I'm, I'm tutoring a woman on how to, uh, how to read the alphabet. I, I helped teach, I helped my friend teach the intermediate adult group. Um, we went over, you know, what we learned this year, my, this past year in Opan, you know, how to, you know, take, give directions, how to um, order in a restaurant, how to tell the time on a clock. I can read Hebrew fluently, and to me, you know, I take it for granted how difficult it is. It's it's completely different shapes, uh, different sounds. Twenty years ago, there were oh, nobody even knew what to do with the sidur, right? The boys, uh, all my friends, we had no idea what to do with the sidur. Not even speaking about, you know, like uh, how to behave in a synagogue, basics, nothing. And, and nowadays, there's a lot of people, you know, Shomer Shabbat coming to the shul every uh, every week and keeping kashrut and, and uh, sending children to the yeshivot in Israel, in America. When the boys from MTA came to Poland, um, I remember um, I remember telling them what is the purpose of our work here in Poland. Why do we do it? Why we are here? How important it is to always give back to the community? How important it is to always have the eyes open and look around because there is somebody who needs help, even if it's in your own community. And even more, if you actually reach out to other communities like here. The Jews in Poland, it would seem like they feel like you know, they don't necessarily matter because they're 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 such a minority, almost as if they're like outliers, almost as if they're just on you know they're marginal. They're they're just on the margins. They're not they're not in the thick of it. And I think that's part of our job here. A part of our job here is is to make them realize that that they're they're part of the Jewish people and they're an important part of the Jewish people. And without them, world Jewry would be very different. And and um, it's very important to all of Jewry. I didn't think that I could possibly inspire people because I'm just an ordinary person. And I realized that it, it does, you don't need to be extraordinary to do it. You just need to show care and energy and effort. The boys were with their energy, their passion, their passion about Judaism, about Jewish life. I just saw how, how our children and their families, they were just the spark, I could see sparks in their eyes. Poland in my eyes has become more of a revival. I think the Names Not Numbers program this year has really, it's made me more aware of, of Jewish life in the past, Jewish life presently, and Jewish life in the future outside of my little, you know, bubble, you know, my New York tri-state area bubble. I remember a distinct moment where it kind of came clear. Was, I think it was 1982. I was in Moscow. Very rough time was in 82. And I met a refusenik. These are the guys who tried to get a visa to go to Israel and then couldn't. Then they were, they lost their jobs and sometime for, for, you know, for 10 or more years. And a young guy, don't remember his name, but I remember him opening the door um, in a white t-shirt, jeans, colorful suspenders, and one of these beautiful, like, Yemenite yarmulkes. And I looked at him, and I said, that could have been me. When people ask me how many Jews are there in Poland, I don't know, I say, I don't know. We still don't know how many. There are not so many of us. And while we can't change the number of Jews killed during the Holocaust, we can change the number of those lost.